As promised, here we are, 2021 NBA Draft. Let's break down who the biggest steals of the night might have been. As with any NBA Draft, we also have to address the steals of the night. For me, there was no bigger steal than Baylor guard Jared Butler. Butler ended up going to the Utah Jazz with the 40th pick. Keep in mind that I had him 15th on my big board. At surface level, the reason for Butler's drop appears to be his health. Butler was held out of workouts for a little while while in the pre-draft process because of medical reasons, and reportedly was diagnosed with a heart condition before college. Hopefully, Butler will be able to have a long NBA career, because if so, he brings everything you might want from a guard, with his steady outside shooting, ability to get to his spots, playmaking, and tough defense. He fits the mold of a jazz player to perfection. An important thing to note is that Jared Butler will not be playing in the Las Vegas Summer League. Butler has not played competitive basketball since leaving Baylor. Given that he was held out of workouts before the draft, the Jazz have chosen to be patient. Another guy that I had ranked as a lottery pick but ended up going much later was Jaden Springer. The Philadelphia 76ers picked Springer at 28, and for me, this was one of the most clever picks of the draft. I'm not quite sure yet how Springer will fit into Philly's backcourt since that appears to be a very fluid situation, but he is worth betting on either way. Despite his really low volume from 3, I expect that Springer will at least be a decent 3-point shooter in the NBA. More importantly, I expect his game to look a lot different given Tennessee's restrictive offensive system. Springer has great functional strength, can handle the ball even though he is not really a primary guard, and he will also be a versatile defender for the Sixers. In the short term, I can see Springer giving the Sixers something similar to Shake Milton rather than a Tyrese Maxey, for instance. He can be a secondary ball handler who can occasionally create for himself, but should never really be the main guy on the court. Also something to keep an eye on will be Springer's fit in Philly if Ben Simmons stays with the Sixers. Should that happen, then his 3-pointer will really become pivotal in order to avoid having two non-shooting guards on the floor at the same time. One of the most talked about names for the wrong reasons on Thursday was Sharif Cooper. Cooper slid all the way to 48 until he was drafted by the Atlanta Hawks. At one point during the draft, I honestly thought that his goal was to become an undrafted free agent in order to pick his destination. In any case, I think this is a smart pick by the Hawks. I'm not a huge fan of Cooper's overall game. I love his diverse passing and he was clearly very effective at the college level, but I also question how much he can do in the NBA. His size, ball-heavy style of play, below-the-rim athleticism, and lack of outside shot are serious problems that likely prompted this slide. Still, Cooper is a really creative passer who still found a way to score more than 20 points per game at Auburn. Cooper was signed this week to a two-way contract. The Hawks can convert that into a three-year deal during the regular season under certain circumstances, but right now, there is a high reward with Cooper and very little risk. At 48, he can evidently be a steal, and I really like the idea of having him behind Trey Young for point guard depth in Atlanta. In reality, I believe that Atlanta might have gotten two steals in this draft. Not only did they draft Cooper, but they also got Jalen Johnson. I did not include the Hawks as one of the best teams in the draft on my last video because these are high-risk, high-reward types of moves. However, I really like the fit with Johnson. Off-court questions aside, Johnson for me had the talent to legitimately go in the top 10 in the 2021 draft. He is a walking mismatch in transition with his size, athleticism, and most of all, vision. But he has also shown enough flashes on defense to pick your interest on that side of the basketball. Offensively, Johnson's biggest improvement area will be creating for himself. He is not a reliable outside shooter yet despite his good 3-point percentages, and he is basically a non-factor off the dribble in the half court. Luckily for him, I do not expect the Hawks to ask Johnson to call his own number a whole lot. Atlanta has plenty of guys that can really score, be it Trey Young of course, but also Bogdan Bogdanovich or Kevin Herter. Instead, I expect that Johnson will be put into situations where he can either take advantages of the attention his teammates get, or he will be asked to make decisions with the ball in his hands when those other guys are doubled. In any case, he will be in a relatively low pressure environment offensively that will also put a lot of emphasis on his development.
The Los Angeles Lakers had a great Thursday night last week. But wait, they had no draft picks, so how can that be? You're right, the Lakers had no draft picks, but they got two steals worthy of the early second round in my opinion by signing Austin Reeves and Joel Ayayi as undrafted free agents. Reeves and Ayayi were two of my favorite backup guards in this class. The Lakers have done a really good job in recent years of developing guys that do not necessarily take the most conventional road to the NBA. And again, I think they nailed these two signings. Reeves and Ayayi will be on two-way contracts next season, and in fact, the word is that they chose not to be drafted in order to land in this situation in LA. Clearly, they are betting on themselves, and it is easy to see why. Reeves out of Oklahoma is an underrated athlete who can play both on and off the ball at the guard spot. Meanwhile, Ayayi out of Gonzaga is someone who I can see having an Alex Caruso type role at the next level. He makes smart decisions off the ball, competes on defense, and he is a respectable enough 3-point shooter. I would not be surprised to actually see at least one of Reeves or Ayayi make it into the Lakers rotation at some point this season. The Detroit Pistons will be happy campers right now. The home run pick for them was clearly the number one overall selection of the draft, Cade Cunningham. However, I thought Detroit also made a really clever pick in Isaiah Livers. Out of the University of Michigan, Livers will be staying in his home state and joining the Pistons' young core. Livers went 42 to Detroit, but I think he has the ability to outperform his draft spot and leave people wondering, why was this guy not a first round pick? The biggest question mark about Livers for me right now are his injuries. Livers is still recovering from a right foot injury that will have him on the shelf for a few more months. He also sustained an ankle injury in his junior season. But those worries aside, Livers is a fantastic shooter and a real floor spacer. These are things that Cunningham and the Pistons need. Livers shot above 40% in his last three college seasons from beyond the arc, all while taking a bigger role in Michigan's program. And while Livers should largely be a spot-up or catch-and-shoot player in the NBA, somewhat like Cam Johnson for Phoenix, he can also do a little bit off the dribble. Livers can occasionally run some pick-and-roll or create for himself, even if those are not really his strengths. Defensively, Livers won't blow you away, but he competes and he has good size at 6'7". Time will tell how his foot recovers, though. Overall, given what Livers can provide with his shooting, productivity while not needing too many touches, and leadership to a young locker room, I thought this was an excellent choice by the Detroit Pistons. What a fall for Brandon Boston Jr., but he could still end up as a steal. Boston was widely touted as a top 5 pick in 2021 before his college season at Kentucky got started. Then everything really went downhill. Without getting into the difficulties that Boston faced off the court after leaving Kentucky, his single season with the Wildcats was very disappointing. Part of this is on Kentucky, but part of this is on Boston as well. I thought Kentucky never did a good job making him feel comfortable on the floor. They had Boston running off screens and into threes for instance, which was never going to be a strong suit of his game. However, Boston himself was just inconsistent and most of all, very inefficient. His shooting improved towards the end of the season, relatively speaking, but Boston's percentages were truly very poor from all around the floor. Boston could not finish at the rim because of his skinny frame, really did not connect on his two-point jumpers, and struggled hard from the perimeter. Still, I'm a believer in Boston's overall package. It might be hard to see right now, but there is a guy in there with great size at 6'7 that can create for himself out of rangy crossovers into smooth pull-ups. I said this in my video about him a few months ago, but Boston's flashes at Kentucky were truly appealing and memorable, at least to me. He ended up plummeting to a nice landing spot with the LA Clippers at 51, a team that has shown willingness to develop prospects such as Terrence Mann or Ivica Zubats, or even rehab the likes of Reggie Jackson or Nicholas Batum. As his rookie year starts, I will be keeping a close eye on how Boston develops in his first year in the NBA. I think the three main guys that I mentioned in this video that really intrigue me at the next level are Isaiah Livers, Brandon Boston Jr., and Jalen Johnson. With Livers, I think that his role in the NBA is going to be a lot more defined as a spot-up or catch-and-shoot player. He showed a little bit more than that at Michigan, but I think his role at the next level will really be in that Cam Johnson mold. What I mean by that is that I expect Livers to eventually be a really important floor spacer for the Detroit Pistons. And like I said in the video, he is a great piece to put around Kate Cunningham. With Brandon Boston Jr., I think it's just a matter of him getting a fresh start after a poor freshman season at Kentucky. Boston, I think that the talent is evident. 
He has all the potential to be that shot-making, rangy wing that NBA teams really look for nowadays. But again, he really struggled, and it seems like his confidence right now is not doing all that well, which is why I think that a fresh start in LA with the Clippers is all that he needs. Now, as we look towards his short-term future, what is Boston going to be? Is he going to be mostly a 3 and D wing early on? I'm not sure if he can be, because even though he has the tools, he is still really skinny. Is he going to be a shot maker off the bench, like a six-man type? I'm not sure the role is there for him either in the Clippers right now with their championship aspirations. So maybe, just maybe, he might have to spend a lot of time in the G League early on. But long term, I do buy the tools. Finally, with Jalen Johnson, I think that his role in the NBA is going to be somewhat similar to how it was in college. What I mean by that is that yes, he still will probably, or at least I hope, he has the chance to go out and transition, attack mismatches, really put that handle and creativity to good use in the open court. However, in the half court, that's obviously where the concerns kick in. Still, like I said in the video, I'm not that worried. With Johnson, I expect him to either act as a play finisher, you know, be it rolling to the rim, standing there, catching lobs, whatever the case may be, or as a facilitator or a connector. Let's say that you have Jalen Johnson and Trey Young on the floor at the same time, so evidently Young is going to be at the point, and Johnson, I don't know, let's have him at the 5 in this scenario. So Trey Young has the ball, he's running the point, whatever, Jalen Johnson comes up, sets the screen, and they double Trey Young out of that. If Johnson gets the ball, then his role there will be either to make the right decision and hit the open man, or play to those numerical disadvantages. I think that Johnson has the intelligence to do that and the creativity, so I'm really looking forward to see how he does on an NBA floor. As always, if you enjoyed the video, make sure to leave a like, make sure to leave a comment to tell me what you think of all of these guys, and if you enjoyed the channel, if you enjoyed the video, if you want to see more content like this, make sure to subscribe. Take care, and I'll see you guys next time.